If you have your Bibles, let's take a look at 1 Kings. I'm in that study of the life of Elijah. I'm only going to study one section. I mention that today because I've had people from the Internet jumping ahead of me. And so I should explain I'm only looking at one section of the life. I will come back to the life of Elijah sometime or another and uh, talk in more further about it. Well, we enter the eight. I started in chapter 17, and we're now in chapter 18. And I'm going to look, look at the first six verses. And I'll tell you, you always pay attention when you're in the Old Testament to this little phrase. It's a wonderful little phrase. It's a, it says, now it came about. No King James was saying it came to pass. <laughs> and it came to pass, just as sure as you're sitting here, it's going to come to pass. And that's a good thing. And pay no attention to the circumstances that's involved to when it comes to pass. Pay attention to the one who has sent it. Now it came to pass. It shows you the perfect timing and the plan of God. That little phrase is really important because it reminds you as a spiritual person studying the word of God on a consistent daily basis for application, how important that you know that everything that touches your life has, has been signed off by God. And even if devil has his hands on it, it's only because his hands are on it because of permission. And therefore, all things can work together for good because God is in control of it all. And it's a good reminder to tell you that the things that come and pass your way, the things that pass through your life are good. They're not bad. They're not bad. And that quick reminder, now it came to pass, that quick reminder as the things that pass through your life, don't pay attention to that as much as the source that's driving it. God is behind it all, and that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. So always pay attention to that little phrase. It's kind of like in the New Testament, I say to you, always pay attention when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, boy, you ought to set up, and those ears ought to be like a, a dog that's caught the scent. Now it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, remember, he has been there. Uh, there. During the third year, he's been with the widow of Zarephath. And now it's, it's, the, it's the half of that year, so we're into the three and a half years when now it came to pass. Now it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord, isn't that wonderful? Listen, everything that passes your way, you have been prepared by the word of God for it. Everything that passes through your life, everything that passes through your life, and it, it's not good or bad, is it? It's all what? It's all good. For doctrinal people, that ought to be a given. It's all good. It's all good because it's in the perfect timing of God, and God is driving it your way to develop your spiritual capacity to understand that God is glorious. And out of that glorious event where God reveals himself through the word of God to your life to cause you to have the assurance and the confidence that this is okay brings praise and glory to him. Well, it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah, that's the directive will, because you're going to see it give him instructions. The word of the Lord came to Elijah at the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. We've had three and a half years of drought. As soon as he gets back to Israel, where three and a half years is going to be up, ding, ding, and the perfect plan of God is going to send rain. He sent the drought. He's going to send the rain. Now, look, <laughs> if you're waiting on a vaccine to cure this virus, you're mistaken. The rain is going to take care of the drought, but it's not going to take care of why God sent it.
you got to know that God said it. The vaccine would be the back part of it that says that God is faithful to keep his people alive to do the things that he's cre created everything to be. But listen, it's not going to, that's, it's a spiritual deal. It's, if this, if this virus doesn't cause a spiritual awakening in your soul, you're asleep at the wheel and the world is under the wheel. This is the drought, the virus. The reason I'm doing this study is the drought is very similar to the virus. It's to bring a spiritual awakening to God in your souls for the unbeliever, for the gospel. For the believer, do you pay attention to the word of the Lord? Do you pay attention to it? As, as God passes things through your life, do you pay attention to the word? The things that are now passing through your life is to awaken you to the word of God. You, you walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. If, that, if those events that pass through your life don't awaken you to the word of God and the power of the word of God in your life, then that which has passed by has passed you by. That's the last thing you want this thing to do. The last thing you want this virus to do is pass by you. You need a spiritual awakening. All of this stuff that flows through your life is to bring a, a, an awakening to categorical Bible doctrine in your soul. Well, I'll get through verse 1 in a minute. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go. Now, here's the directive will of God again after three and a half years. Go again. Go show yourself. That's what, this is how this whole thing started. Three and a half years ago, he told the directive will of God, told Elijah, go show yourself to King Ahab and tell him what the Lord has told you to tell him. He told him, clean up your act. Get rid of the worship of Baal and put me back where I belong and set the centerpiece of Israel. Ahab said, <laughs> that's uh, Hebrew. Go you sell your soul, show, go show yourself to Ahab, King Ahab, the eighth king from Jeroboam, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. That's your vaccine. Now the question is, what occurred between that with God is going to make it important. So Elijah went and showed himself to King Ahab. The famine was severe in Samaria, the capital city. Ahab ca called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. That's wonderful. And it came about when Jezebel, hello, destroyed the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them in by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Isn't God faithful? We've seen him use the ravens to feed Elijah every morning and every night from the king's table at the brook. Then he says about the time he got comfortable and got to know how to call the ravens in a little closer to drop it closer to where he was sitting. Uh, better st steward of my food, ravens. God just says when he got in the comfort zone, God sent him uh, to Zarephath. He thought maybe he's going to get a, uh, get to uh, vacation to the seaport of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. You know, like going to Disney World or something. And he said, yeah, where you go, there's going to be a widow there that's going to provide food for you. Logistical grace. You think logistical grace is important in your life? I tell you. 99.9% .9 of America doesn't know a thing about it. Doesn't have a clue, not even in the church, the importance. They think, well, it don't matter what they think. Doesn't matter. Well, 
Here God is taking care of a hundred prophets. Now here's what's really interesting. He killed, she killed all the rest of them. He hid 50s in caves. You know what's really interesting to me? The power of the word of God. You know what that hundred turned into? You know what that hundred turned into? Between 17 and 19, between chapter 17 and 19, you know, you know how many, you know, you know how many that 7,000 knees. They're underground. Well, I don't know how far down the cave went. This is the underground church. Isn't it interesting how God takes care of his people? Not only did he hide them from the sword of Jezebel, but took care of them. And these guys are going to turn into 7,000 knees that don't bail, don't kneel to Baal. You see, there was a purging. Listen to me. There was a purging going on of, of evil in the North Kingdom by God underground and nothing on the top of it because Ahab wouldn't respond to the directive will of God. What a wonderful opportunity this would have been in a spiritual reformation had, had Ahab paid attention to the word of God because God already had, was building a spiritual army, an invisible spiritual army for a spiritual war. Are, are we part of that invisible? Are we that underground, quote, church? During this crisis, are we the only one that have an understanding of what this crisis is about? Well, I'm confident my people aren't or they'd be here. You can social distance. I got enough room here to social distance. I got a lot of empty pews. I know my people don't know this. So maybe somebody on the internet is listening. Because this is really important. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water, to all the valleys. Perhaps we will find grass and keep our horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. That's how bad it was. So he divided the land between the two of them and they surveyed it. Ahab went one way by himself. Obadiah went the other. I mean... How futile it is, the way we, the things we look for in the midst of something that God has made so obvious to you. How, all the things we look for and miss what's under our nose. I mean, they're, 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 they're so caught up in the drought, they've lost God. This is not about a drought, this is about God. This is not about a drought. This is about God. This is not about a virus. This is about God. Well, how many times I got to tell you that? Uh, until, I guess until, until the election. Then we won't have this. We will not have the drama that we have. Well, there it is. Let's have a word of prayer, and I want to get into my morning study. Now, this is, I just introduced the passage to you. Don't get crazy. We're not leaving already. For you see, for some people, this is a Sunday service. I just introduced the passage. Let's pray. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do I get out of carnality back to, into spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of every church age believer? Confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me. Watch this word, cleanse. That word cleanse is important because it takes us to the cross of Jesus Christ, verse 7. It takes us to the cross of Jesus Christ and reminds us as a believer that God has made a provision for us to be spiritual through the confession of sin, the blood of Christ on the cross cleanses us, not into salvation,
but because we're saved into spirituality. That's why confession is important. And therefore, in Bible study, the Holy Spirit teaches you and recalls the word of God to your soul. That's why you put it there. So, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way. Study with us. I pray their hearts would be open to the truth of the word of God. To become obedient. Stop looking at the circumstances and pay attention to the word of God. Made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you a little history lesson. Won't take long. It's not on your paper either. Let me give you a little lesson that covers 1 Kings 7, 17 through 19. That's all I'm covering in my series on the life of Joseph in this first part of the series. I'm not going to go any further than that because I'm after the drought. My people are in a crisis of virus, and I'm trying to teach them what is really going on. But here's something of interest. When we get to the time of Ahab and the, and the great ministry of Elijah, even though he was it, it covered three kings, the majority, the main part was the drought part because he had been sent and God was preparing the undertow for it. He was sending for a spiritual reformation, a reformation. You know, we're familiar with reformations. He wanted a spiritual reformation. The North Kingdom. In 930, the Davidic Kingdom, the unified Davidic Kingdom, was divided. Rehoboam got the two, and Jeroboam took ten. They split a civil war kind of thing without the war. It wasn't civil either. And so, it's, so we have these two. We have the ten, 10 tribes of the North Kingdom. Their capital is in Samaria. And then, of course, we have the two uh, carrying the Davidic and uh, the Messianic Covenant. Judah carried the Messianic Covenant. Judah. Well, when we get to Ahab, Ahab's the tenth of 20 kings from Jeroboam. And he made all the other evil kings look like saints by the way he, he, the way he acted uh, spiritually. His wife Jezebel, he gave her the reins over the spiritual part of the kingdom. Can you imagine? He gave it to this unbelieving woman. Gave her spiritual reigns over his kingdom. This is what showed how little he understood the importance of the word of God in his life. So the first thing she did is purge the nation of all, all the prophets of the word of God. Obadiah, interesting guy of history, uh, rescued a hundred of them, put them in, in caves of 50 in, in, a, in caves and preserved Elijah's on the scene. He's the prophet on, up on top of that. He's the public prophet. He's the prophet of the nation. We got a hundred under the scene, and those hundred under the scene, the, those, uh, we call it underground church, they did a mighty job. Elijah's up, and he's the public voice, and he's working with Ahab. Ahab, he's been sent to Ahab to, to lead a spiritual reformation. So we, we have a divided kingdom in, uh, around nine, 930. And we got Ahab in here. That's 10th century. Now we got Ahab in there. In the middle, the north kingdom is going to go from 930 to 722 B.C. when they get hit with the fifth. They th if they think the drought was bad, they had nothing that was just stage, that was just like stage two of uh, divine discipline. And when they hit it's five, and it will, will in 722. Now, what's important about that date is Elijah's ministry is in the middle of that. Right in the middle of it. They're at a turning point. The North Kingdom is a turning point. And God sends Elijah in there because they've had, since 930 all the way down to, 
to Ahab, they've had e evil kings. They've been the epitome of evil against God. And God sends Elijah in the middle of this thing. And so let's, let's turn this thing around. Let's turn it around. And yet, they're going to have another 200 years. You know why? Because it's 2 Peter 3.9. That's, that's why God puts up with you and me. Because of 2 Peter 3.9. God is not willing that any perish, but all come to salvation. That's why. Long suffering of God, the short suffering of man. The short suffering of man is for the long suffering of God to come at peace. With salvation comes peace from God to you and from you to others. Why do you think this crisis is in your life? Call the virus. And so, in 200 years, the North Kingdom is going to fall. When you compare, and often you'll have a study Bible, they will compare the 20 kings of Judah to the 20 kings of the North Kingdom. And they'll run them side by side through it. When you study it, the 10 kingdoms never took the spiritual awakening from God serious. When you study the southern kingdom, there were periods when the prophets were able to get the kings to lead spiritual reformations like Josiah. Josiah? Just an example. And so they have a, a much longer history. From 930, they go to 586 B.C. before they hit the wall of the fifth cycle of discipline. Leviticus 26. I tell you that to show you that what God is after is a spiritual. He's after America. Listen, he's saying to America, you need to have a spiritual awakening to the unbeliever, the gospel, to the church, the word of God. The church is asleep at the wheel. All this Bible doctrine, now was the time to use it. You got all this stuff stored up. Live by it. Live by it. Share it with others. There ought to be whole Bible studies going on. Young people should be sharing with young people the truth of the word of God. Married couples should be sharing with me. Now, listen, listen. When this, when this virus is over, this is going to be a mess to clean up. Not the mess in the street. I'm talking about the mess in the homes. And if you don't send your kids back to school this year or do good homeschooling with the word of God as well, see, I, I think they ought to pull them into their homes and teach the kids and teach them, have Bible study with them as well. You're not going to get it in the public system. They're not going to get anything in the public system this year. It's going to be a year of dumb and down, worse than we've ever had. And listen, child abuse, it will go out of, it will go out of sight. The great recorder of child abuse in America, which is out of sight, has been the school. The school system. The school system, those teachers, those teachers, those kids talk to those teachers, and those teachers report it. My, 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 you talking about, listen, every time we find a little child shot on the streets, I mean, who would believe that in Birmingham, Alabama, you would find kids shot on the street? Listen, nothing, that compares nothing to what's going on in the homes right now. And everybody's 
uptight and away from everybody and nobody's reporting anything because they're uptight, waiting on a vaccine to be a miracle drug? My, my, my. What's wrong with us? Well, I thought I would take the story of Elijah because I learned it from James. I was looking through and I said, Father, I've got to get ahead of this thing. How am I going to do this? He said, it's in the book of James. I went, why? Sure enough, I read the book of James over again. I found it in the fifth chapter. Elijah and the drought. I went, well, thank you. So I went back and looked at it, and out of it came a study. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. James 5, 17 through 20. James was the first guy that used it. He used Elijah in his day to talk about a spiritual awakening. And so I've co I'm covering that period. Point number one. Elijah was a man of the word of God. You know who told me that? <laughs> Not Elijah. The men of the word of God don't go around and brag they're men of the word. They're too busy studying the word and teaching it. A Gentile woman. <laughs> a Gentile woman, a witch of the Sidonians of the worship of Baal, called the widow of Zarephath. She told me, listen to what she said. Listen to her wonderful testimony. The last verse of chapter 17. You are a man of God, and the word of God is in your mouth, and the word of God in your mouth is truth. And she means absolute truth. You know why she calls it truth, absolute truth? is because what he says comes to pass. Now it came to pass. Well... Elijah told her, as she was preparing her last meal to eat with her son and die, if you will share that last meal with me, you will never go hungry as long as the drought is here. And God, the God, his God, the Lord of the living, was true. It was true. I never went without a meal. That was her testimony. Then her son died with a full stomach. <laughs> In the midst of a drought that was killing everybody else. And God wonderful. God is true to the word. The prophet speaks as truth. And Elijah raised the child from the dead. And she went, cha-ching, cha-ching. This God of the living is also the God of the dead. Baal don't compare with either one of them. I was dying and drawn and worshiping the God of the rain. And I know nobody, nobody in our, in our religion can raise the dead. But this man, his God raised my child from the dead. And she was the witch of necromancy, like 1 Samuel 28. She could, listen, she didn't have the power to do that. She got permission. Satan had to get permission to give her permission to do it. Don't you know that? You ought to read Job 1 and 2. Pay attention to it. You can't do nothing to people apart from, listen, God is not willing that any would perish. He's going to turn it over to the devil? My, my, my. <laughs> well, her testimony. You're a man of absolute truth. Your God is a God of absolute truth. He says, I take care of the living. He takes care of the lady. I take care of the dead. He takes care of the dead. That's the God I want. And she became a believer. You know why God sent Elijah? Listen to me. You ought to know by now, I keep telling you, to convert somebody could convert others. This is a foreign mission trip. And she converted the national, a witch. 
who got, has got a story to tell, boy. What's happened to our story to tell? We've got the story to tell. Right, Austin? We've got the story to tell. We've got a story to tell. No matter what age you are, we've got a story to tell. How come we're not telling that story? I know William is. I know William is. He lives to tell that story. Let me tell you, the devil tries to destroy the word that's in our mouth. You know, you know what the, dev the devil's after? He's after the word of God that's in your mouth. Because that's the truth. And boy, does he fear the truth. You know what the truth, you know how dangerous the truth of God is? When Paul described the spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, chapter, he talked about the angelic conflict in the spiritual realm, verses 10 through 17. He said, the offensive weapon against the devil, his entire army, is the sword of the spirit. The word of God. You know why he said that? Because of Hebrews 4.12. Because it can drive to the very heart and soul of man and become a critic of the thoughts and intentions of his heart. That's why he fears the word of God. He fears the word of God in your life. When you put the word of God in your mouth and speak that word of God, it is the spirit of the, it is the sword of the spirit that drives to the heart of the issue in man. My, my, what a wonderful day it is to study the Word of God. Listen, you know what the devil is into? And boys, he caught America. You know, what the, you, know what the, you know what evil runs off from? Relativity. You send your kids to colleges, that's what they get. Relativity. There are no absolutes. The Bible is full of absolutes. You throw the Bible away, you got relativity. You pick the Bible up, you got absolute truth. My, my, my. How do you know that, Ronnie? It has delivered my life in so many different ways, it's impossible to tell you in a short time. The absolute truth of the Word of God. Mm -mm -mm. Everybody else lives by relativity. Well, it feels good to me. Feels good to me. My old man, do what I want to do. I'm not scared of it. Everybody's got a scare point. Everybody. Everybody's got one. The word of the Lord once delivered, watch this. The word, of the, Lord, war, the word of the Lord once delivered, it depends on whether they have positive or negative volition to the directive will of God, whatever the word is telling them. Once it's delivered, boy, this is so important. Once it's delivered, it's got to be delivered by somebody, Elijah. Once it's delivered, it's delivered to volition. Either it's positive or negative. That's not up to you. It, I don't determine that. I'm sent to put the word on him. Positive and negative volition depends on whether you have primary or secondary negative volition. James covered that. Here's primary, here's primary volition. Hearers of the word. Here's secondary. Doers of that word. Do you hear that? Come on. That's James the second chapter. No, James the first chapter. That's in James 1, 2. 2, 2. Well, somewhere, James 1, 22. It's in that neighborhood. All right? Listen, that's so important. You listen, you deliver the word. The word is delivered to volition. Volition has the choice. It's a free agent in the angelic conflict, volition. In man, that's the free agent part of him. Primary, be a hearer. 
Secondary, be a doer of what you've heard. James covered that very clear. At least in my opinion, he did. Here's another one, Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32. The parable, the parable of the two sons. The father had two sons. He says to the sons, he said to the first son, son, go work in my vineyard today. The son said, no, I'm going. I got other plans today. I had lived that part. So he goes to the second son. He says, go work in my vineyard today. His son said, yes, sir. Oh, I am all over it, dad. Then he goes back and he says, well, look, the first son said, I won't go. Felt remorse. Regretted. It's a word in Greek. Regretted or remorse about it. And went to the vineyard and worked. The second son, to please his father and to get him out of the room, said, yes, sir, I'm the, I'm the guy for the job. You can count on me. Consider it done, Dad. Go fishing. I had lived that. And didn't do it. So Jesus asked a question. He said, see, it's volition, isn't it? Oh, please tell me. You see volition there. They both received the same message. They both acted differently, volitionally. He said, which did the father's will? Whoa, this test is good. They all went, well, the one that did the father's will. Then he launches into a wonderful study you should study. I hope I teased you enough to get you to do that. I hope I did. Because you want to pay attention when he got down to the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors. I always thought that was an interesting duo. The, I, the IRS. No, I don't. I'm just, I'm just saying. I just, it's the way I thought. Elijah's responsibility is to deliver the directive will of God in the complete truth. That's the directive will of God. I love Paul. When he did it in Acts 26, verses 12 through 19, he stood, between, he stood before King Agrippa. And he laid the gospel onto him because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus dies on the cross for your sin. Listen to me now. Those are, are, are by internet. I don't know. You thought you were going to go to the bathroom and get a cup of coffee. Wait a minute. Jesus Christ goes to the cross. He dies on a cross for your sins and mine. He is buried, and on the third day of the burial, he was raised from the dead to give us life everlasting. We call it eternal life theologically. You get it now, and you have it forever. By the grace of God, you didn't earn it. You got it, and you'll forever have it because of the grace of God. My, my. So he's, he lays all of that out because of Romans 1.16. Paul understands that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So he lays that gospel out to King Agrippa, makes an appeal to King Agrippa, and listen to what King Agrippa said. It's a famous saying. I would wish to God. Oh, there's a religious gobbledygook. There's a guy who goes to church every Christmas. Every Christmas, you can find he goes to church, gives a little bit of money during that time, appeases his guilt. And, I wish to God, I, 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 I wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I, except for these chains, born again. King Agrippa said, well, you know, Paul, you almost convinced me. That's when Paul laid that on him. You almost convinced me. Listen, almost not enough to get into heaven. <laughs> almost, it won't get you there. Point number two, as we study the life of Elijah... 
We understand the importance of the directive will of God in his ministry. The widow of Zarephath both had the experience and the expression of it. In 1 Kings 17, 15, and 16, and the 17th chapter, verse 24, which I recall to you. I have people say to me all the time, Ron, I don't get this directive will of God. How does this thing work? So I'm going to show you how it works. Because I got the story to tell you in the Bible. So I laid it out, chapter 17, 18, and 19. I laid it out so you would not miss it. Let me show you the directive will of God that Elijah is working. In 1 Kings 1 and verse 2, he's told to go to Ahab and tell him he must choose between Baal worship and God worship or be disciplined. Drought. It begins by saying, in verse 2, the word of the Lord came to him saying, that's the directive will of God. Then he's told by the Lord, go to the brook Ketrit, and the ravens will feed you twice a day logistical grace. That's the directive will. In verse 8, he says, God says to the widow of Zarephath, I'm going to send a prophet from Israel to you. Take care of him. She will physically provide for Elijah, and Elijah will spiritually provide for her. That's how this stuff works, you know. In chapter 18, which is interesting, we have one. It begins with the word of the Lord came to him. And he says, as in our text today, go show yourself to Ahab. Tell him God will send rain. In the 18th chapter, verse 46, it says, and that's interesting, the hand of the Lord was with Elijah. If you notice, it's the last verse of the chapter. When you get to chapter 19, the directive will becomes a play again. It begins with the word of the Lord came to Elijah in a cave. In a cave? What are you doing in a cave? That's the question he asked Elijah. In verse 11, he tells him to go forth and stand on the mountain of the Lord. That'll be a fearful experience for Elijah. It won't, listen, what, when he was on the Mount of Carmel with the prophets of Baal, that was nothing to compare that when God told him to go out and stand on the cliff on the mountain. Wait till I get to that one. In verse 15, the directive will of God, go return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus. And boy, should you pay attention to 19, verses 15 through 19. Let me tell you, when God tells you to go someplace, you should go someplace. Because there are great things in store for you. There are great things that you can't see ahead of it. Boy, that's going to be powerful. It's on, that, it's on that visit that he appoints Elisha to take his place. Just to give you an idea. Point number three. The directive will of God was given to Elijah for others as well as himself. It was delivered faithfully, no matter what the circumstances or person, whether it be the king Ahab or the witch of Zarephath. Once that directive will of God is delivered by you, the permissive will of God comes in play. The hearer of the directive will of God must accept and obey or reject and disobey. If it is rejected, the overruling will of God goes to work. To bring the directive will of God back into focus. God sent a three and a half year drought to bring a spiritual awakening to the directive will of God for the priest nation of Israel. God wanted King Ahab of the priest nation to lead a spiritual reformation with Elijah from Baal back to God. My, my, my. As a prophet of God, the success, listen to me now closely. As a prophet of God, a communicator of the word of God, the success of Elijah's ministry was not on whether they accepted or rejected it, but on the deliverance of it.
Make sure you get that. So I showed you the dynamics of the directive will of God, the permissive will of God, and the overruling of God working within our greater context of our study. Now in closing, these three categories, the directive will of God, the permissive will of God, and the overruling will of God, has three categories that must always line up under each of them. I'm going to show it to you. They must line up under each of them. For example, the geographical will, the operational will, and the mental will of God. And, I, I, and we have three illustrations of it. For example, the directive will of God in 1 Kings 17, leave Israel and go to the brook, the beginning of the drought. It, was, it had a, the directive will of God. It had a, a geographically, leave, leave Samaria, the capital, and go to the brook until told differently. The mental will of God. Ravens will feed you twice a day. Logistical grace will supply. Operational. Training. Listen to me. Here's what happened at the brook. What was important for his next assignment. He's, listen, this is always about a next assignment. It's not about this one. It's about a next one. Now, pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. Training in faith rest of the faith cycle. You know, when you look at the faith cycle, you have the hearing, the believing, the applying, the completing. Between applying and completing is where faith rest works. Right there. That's where it works. It's that waiting period. God has prepared you. Well, why am I, why, why, why am I waiting? Well, you need to pay attention to Psalms 27, 14. There's always a waiting period. That waiting period is for you to develop a very close, significant relationship with God Almighty personally. Why, why, why is there a waiting period in my life? I know what he wants me to do. Why, 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 why is this? Because you don't understand how important the significance of the relationship between you and God is. You say, well, I know, I know, I know God. I know the essence box of God. No, I want you to know it personally. Because your next assignment, you're going to need to know it. You know what his next assignment was? He was going to raise the dead. Holy cat, push. I'm a guy who teaches the word of God. You want me to raise the dead? <laughs> huh. Huh. And so this waiting period is a period where you come back to the reflection. Listen, God is omnipotent. God is sovereign. What are you doing? What do you do in your downtime? What do you do in this waiting period? This R and R period? You focus on your relationship with God. Why do you think the why do you think Jesus went off privately and prayed? Why do you think that? God, praying to God. For what reason? Why would God have to pray to God? Why would the second member of the Godhead have to pray to the first member of the Godhead? Because he's in humanity. Because he's in his humanity. And prayer is everything. It's how you build your relationship of the uniqueness of that relationship. Because God is going to ask you to do some things in the future. They're going to call the essence of God into play. He didn't say you're going to raise a child from the dead. He just said you really need to snug up and get close to me and understand that I am God Almighty. I'm your father. This is a big deal for us. This is a big deal for us. And so that's really important. Then he says, here's a second illustration. Leave the brook and go to Zarephath three years into the drought. Now we're three years into the drought. We're still in chapter 17. So he goes to, to Zarephath geographically. He goes to Zarephath to the widow until told differently. Mental will of God. She will provide for you. She will feed you logistical grace. Operational will. 
Elijah feed her spiritually. Elijah is going to convert her and has to disciple her for the work of the Lord. Now we have it a third time. Leaves Arafat and returned to Israel, faced King Ahab. Now we're in chapter 18, and we're at the end of the drought. There's a geographical place. Leaves Arafat, returned to Samaria, the capital of the North Kingdom. Mental will of God. Show yourself to Ahab. What has he learned from the discipline? Give him the directive will of God again. Operational. Tell him God is about to send rain. God wants Ahab to lead a spiritual reformation against Baal worship. Go back and say, only God. God brought the drought. God brought the rain. What does that mean? Quit worshiping Baal. Quit worshiping Ma Mammon. It's God or Mammon. And so it is. So what, what have we learned? God is faithful. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1.19. God is faithful. God is faithful. It's not his role that, that we have to deal with. It's our role. It's our role in the crisis. What is God teaching me? He had a lesson for Ahab. He had a lesson for the widow. He has a lesson for Elijah. What's the lesson? What's the lesson for us? That's the point. Well, let's have a word of prayer. And we'll get out of here today. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you, Father, for the story of Elijah as he returns to Samaria to confront Ahab again with the same directive will of God that he began with three and a half years ago. When this, drought, when this virus is over, what have we learned? When the vaccine is given, what have we learned? What are the great lessons that God has taught us? Where has the ministry been during that time? What is the great ministry that has occurred in our life during the time of the crisis that probably would have never occurred in the way it occurred apart from the virus? These are the lessons I pray we would learn. It's the ones I desire to have put in my journal. during the COVID-19. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.